So hi everyone, um, welcome to this webinar. It's the first in our new series of webinars, Think Wider webinar series, new perspectives on domestic revenue mobilization. So what the webinar series aims to do is facilitate a discussion on how domestic revenue mobilization can be supported in developing countries or in the global South. The monthly webinars will cover a range of topics related to the development of tax systems, development of non-tax domestic revenue mobilization, as well as political institutions. The series is aimed for policy and development cooperation professionals, as well as researchers who are interested in hearing the latest insights from UNU Wider's research on domestic revenue mobilization. The program seeks to help improve developing countries' tax systems and to strengthen their domestic capacities for revenue mobilization. So first of its kind is going to be a um, webinar on tax effort revisited, how much tax can low income countries expect to collect. It's going to be a presentation on recent research on the subject, as well as the panel discussion involving two panelists. The presentation is going to be done by Kyle McNabb, who is our friend and former colleague, currently a development, economics, uh, development economist, who works with the Overseas Development Institute in London. He is a tax policy analyst for the Tax Dev Program and is based in Kampala. As part of the panel, we're going to have a colleague here at WIDA, Michael Dankwa, who is a development economist and research fellow at UNU WIDA. Michael maintains primary research interests in economic development, especially in Sub Saharan Africa, primarily focusing on issues such as inclusive growth informality and productivity growth amongst others. Also in attendance with the panel is Joyce Chuma, who is the founder and director of Salima Research Consultancy. Prior to that, Joyce was a lecturer in development economics for 12 years at the Midland State University in Zimbabwe. Her main research interests are in tax policy and tax administration in developing countries. I'll be the chair of this session and I'm Abraham Stagem, myself a research associate at UNU WIDER, focusing primarily on taxation in developing countries as well. A few housekeeping rules. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available, I think a couple of days or weeks from now on YouTube for people who want to revisit and you know watch the presentation. Because there are many people in attendance, we can't raise our hands to ask questions. So please post your questions in the chat. For questions which might be a bit technical or people who are interested in the technical or econometric aspects of the questions or of the paper, please refer to the working paper. Um, I think Eva is going to include the link to the working paper as well as the link to the current GRD update. I don't think there is much more which we have to say. So enjoy the webinar and Kyle, the floor is yours. Can you see the presentation on my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect. I'll assume everyone else can as well. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Abrams. Um, as Abrams has said, my name is Kyle McNabb. Um, I'm a researcher with uh, the ODI and I'm based in Kampala, Uganda. Um, and so we're going to be presenting today um, a joint paper between myself, Michael, and Abrams. Uh, we started a couple of years ago and published at the end of last year um, called Tax Effort Revisited uh, New Estimates from the Government Revenue Dataset. Um, I should probably start by disappointing everyone um, because the, the question posed in the title of the webinar was how much tax can low-income countries collect to expect, expect to collect. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to give a definitive answer to that during the course of the presentation. Um, but we will be tackling issues around how you think about measuring that and why we think the work that we've done here makes a step in the right direction um, toward better estimating tax effort and tax potential in, in low and middle income countries. So in terms of the roadmap for the next 20 or so minutes, we'll talk a little bit about the background and context of why this is perhaps important or timely, um, briefly review some literature um, that has gone before us, um, talk a little bit uh, in sort of high level terms about the estimation that we do um, before talking about the results and importantly, the implications and 
uh, limitations of the of the study. Um, okay, so in terms of the context um, for this, I'm, I'm sure most of you in the audience are very well aware that average tax to GDP ratios in low income countries are much lower than those in high income countries. Um, our, our most recent estimates from the government revenue data set, which is maintained at UNU wider, suggests that on average, low income countries collect around 12% of GDP in tax revenue um, compared to around 22% in high income countries. Um, and when you include social security contributions, um, the average in high income countries in recent years stands at around 29% of GDP. Um, there's almost no difference for low income countries when you account for mandatory social security contributions. So there's quite a gap. Um, and there's also a very pressing need um, for low and middle income countries to to raise revenue in order to not only recover from the economic fallout of the pandemic um, or to tackle the current cost of living crises, um, but also there's this overarching agenda of the sustainable development goals, which um, were hoped to be attained um, by the end of this decade. Um, recent research from the IMF, Dora Benedek and others, um, has estimated that on average, both public and private sector together would need to raise about 14% of GDP per year per country in spending to meet the sustainable development goals by the end of the decade. Um, that is, um, I, I've, I've said on the screen, that's a non-trivial amount. Perhaps I'm I'm underselling um, how much that really is in terms of, of what's currently being collected in many low-income countries. Um, so there is this sort of overarching focus still on how can developing countries work to collect um, more tax revenue to fund those pressing development needs. Which brings us to the idea of tax effort. Um, for those of you that aren't aware or didn't haven't really engaged with literature in this, uh, or engaged with this literature, tax effort is essentially the ratio of actual tax collected to potential tax collected. Um, we're reasonably good at, at understanding how much tax is currently actually collected in most countries. Um, we're less good at, at understanding what's the potential amount of tax that could be collected. And that's where different modeling approaches have come up with different, um, different ideas and results. Um, so this is a big challenge and one that we, one that we tackle in this work. Um, why is this important? Um, tax effort figures and results from tax effort studies over the last decade or two um, you know, often appear in sort of donor work, advisory, um, advisory reports, civil society work, um, and can sometimes be seen or misconstrued as realistic targets or benchmarks um, to which governments should be um, aiming, or or expectations over what governments might currently be collecting, and um, have often been used as evidence to encourage developing country governments to enhance their tax collection or to collect more tax. Um, so in this world that tax effort figures are used in this in this sort of way um, by donors, civil society and others, um, we felt that it was important that they were estimated as accurately as possible. And thus any sort of advice that finds the desk of a policymaker is grounded in fairly realistic expectations um, regarding tax revenue mobilization. Um, we, we came at this with sort of a a lens that, with a concern over the, the previous tax effort estimates that existed and were being used um, um, for those purposes. Um, particularly, we saw some bias in the estimation methods um, and perhaps a lack of attention to detail um, in how those scores were produced. Um, and that's something that we tried to tackle and we'll say a little bit more about later. Um, Importantly, we absolutely don't reinvent the wheel here, but we do revisit existing findings. Um, we employ new wider data sources, um, make some enhancements on the methodology, and we hope that we've been able to better estimate tax effort um, or more closely estimate the true value of tax effort according to these modeling approaches for a bigger sample of countries than has been done before and for longer time periods. Um, I probably already hinted in the direction that tax effort estimates do come with several very important limitations, which I will discuss at the end. Um, so please wait for, for that before 
before drawing any conclusions. In terms of the, the sort of literature in this field, there's a fairly rich literature um, of economists trying to estimate the determinants of tax ratio across countries um, since it, at least the 1950s. Perhaps someone had thought about it or written about it prior to that. And um, that's the earliest sort of record we were able to find. Um, traditionally, this involved um, when econometrics came into the writing, some regression of ta the tax ratio on the left-hand side of an equation on a measure of development, such as GDP per capita, a measure of exposure to international trade, sometimes called openness, some proxy for the structure of the economy, usually how big is the agricultural sector or how big is the manufacturing sector, also whether or not um, a country is resource rich or resource dependent. Um, later, the literature increasingly attempted to understand the sort of mediating role of demographic and socioeconomic or governance factors, like things like are more urbanized countries better at collecting tax, um, are more educated companies, countries, excuse me, better at collecting tax. Um, what about the role of democracy, um, perceptions of corruption, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, there's quite a, a rich literature of those sorts of regressions. And if you've sort of engaged with that literature, you'll know that a lot of authors have, have looked at the topic. Um, in order to move from those, um, from those papers to understanding tax effort, what some authors did um, was, to, was to calculate a tax effort score based on actual tax revenue divided by the predicted value from that regression. Um, and that very simple equation essentially means that a tax effort score could be greater than one, equal to one, or less than one, depending on where um, the country lay in, in respect to the regression line from the OLS regression. And this is fine in theory. And, you know, th then thinking about what does that actually mean? Um, we're not convinced, and I'm, I'm personally not convinced, that, a re that to tell a policymaker that his or her revenue effort is 1.5 is a particularly salient uh, thing. Um, that might suggest, or that might be interpreted as a country is collecting revenue beyond its means. Um, that's absolutely not the case. Um, all that says is that in the group of countries that the estimation has been carried out on, that country might be doing better relative to the other ones in that equation, or in that regression, sorry. Um, so understanding tax effort and tax potential according to ordinarily squares estimations um, don't provide particularly salient or, me or meaningful results. More recent studies over the last sort of 10 to 15 years have moved to thinking about estimating tax effort according to what's called a stochastic frontier analysis. And broadly, um, um, this sort of has its roots about, yeah, around about 2010 by authors at the IMF uh, Finocchietto and Pacino, and has notably been replicated by authors at the IGC, uh, Langford and Olenberg, and more recently um, in 2019 by Moeje and Sibude. Um, this approach essentially models um, tax collection according to a production function and estimates a kind of what's known as a tax frontier, which gives a theory or represents the theoretical maximum amount of tax a country could collect given the inputs in the model. Um, and so a tax effort score of one would mean that a country is at the tax frontier or the theoretical maximum amount and anything less than one um, or the distance between tax effort and that tax frontier or tax potential um, is essentially caused by two things in the model, um, a random error and an inefficiency term. The inefficiency term is what we're trying to get at and isolate in tax effort studies. We want to understand um, that inefficiency term as best as possible and disentangle that from any sort of random um, or stochastic error within the modeling process. Um, and that's where we think we've made a bit of a contribution in the modeling side of things. And I should sort of say that Michael Dankwa, who's on the panel and will hopefully say a few words afterwards, is the the expert in that side of the of the paper, and we'll hopefully give a few more technical details if required. Um, but what, but in order to illustrate why we think um, our approach has been a slight improvement on previous papers, um, let me show you results from four different types of estimation of the stochastic tax frontier. And um, the four different approaches are on the screen. There's a pooled model, a random effects model, 
the Batese and Coeli model, and there's a true random effects model. So previous literature has focused largely on numbers two, and especially number three, the Batese Coeli model. Um, so the key, the key question is, which of these models is actually best? Um, and if you look at the results of what the tax effort scores look like after estimation, um, there's four histograms on the screen. And so these simply show the distribution of the tax effort scores, which again are at a maximum of one. So on the x-axis runs from zero to one. Um, according to the pooled random effects, batez Coeli and true random effects procedures from top left to bottom right. Um, you can see that the estimation according to true random effects approach stands out. Um, it's a lot more rightward skewed. So on average, the tax effort scores are higher than under other modeling assumptions. And there's also a much tighter variance in the estimation of the scores. Um, you can see that the, for example, just to the left of the true random effects uh, histogram, the batez Coeli specification, um, has a reasonably normal distribution with a sort of, you know, average of around maybe 0.4, um, which is significantly lower. Um, and then you see under random effects and and the pooled model in the top two panes of the of the of the top two histograms, um, you see a massive spread in the distribution of tax effort scores. Um, so we set about to try and understand why the true random effects model um, stood out like this. And what we uncovered was that this model is actually much better able to disentangle those two terms I spoke about five minutes ago. Remember I said the distance from the tax frontier to where a country is at a given point in time is a mixture of a random error or what's written here as unobserved time invariant heterogeneity and inefficiency. Um, other models aren't able to disentangle these two to the same extent. And thus what ends up happening is that part of what's actually a random error ends up being attributed to inefficiency. So you end up with a lower tax effort score and a higher degree of inefficiency. We go back to the graphs or the histograms, sorry, you see that under the other modeling approaches, the tax effort scores are on average lower. Um, and we see this as a substantive limitation of the batez Coeli and random effects models, which had previously been published and used and sort of made their way into some, you know, donor advice or policy thinking. Um, and it does have implications for their interpretation and for their use. In terms of what our results actually look like, I've tried to give a snapshot on the screen without going into too much minute detail, but we find that the average tax effort score globally is about 0 0.84. Um, thus, tax potential, which is sim simply the current average tax collect tax to GDP ratio globally divided by 0 0.84, is about 20.9% of GDP for the year 2019, um, which represents about an average increase of about three and a quarter percent of GDP um, across countries. Now, a an average across countries perhaps isn't the most salient measure um, to look at, um, but in terms of comparison with previous work. Um, the IGC study in 2016 found an average tax effort score of 64 or 0.64, and the replication a few years ago found it to be 0.47. And that's saying that on average, countries are collecting less than half of their tax potential. Um, if you look at, on the right-hand side, the, the, the short table on the screen, you see that across specifically across regional regions um, or as defined by the World Bank, those scores differ somewhat. So you see that in perhaps Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, um, those tax effort scores are on average, you know, 88 to 87 um, percent, um, whilst in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa or East Asia and Pacific, they're closer to 0 0.8 or 80 percent. Um, so there is, um, there is a bit of heterogeneity across um, regions. We also compared our scores against um, a database called the Collecting Taxes Dataset, or the Collecting Taxes Database, which is maintained by USAID. And I think at least every year or every two years, um, USAID re-estimates tax effort scores along the lines of some of the previous work and under some of the same modeling assumptions of the previous work that we've discussed. Um, and so what this on the screen shows you again is that Again, we see a much a much tighter um, distribution of our scores um, on the x-axis, 
Um, so from left to right, you see a much less of a spread, and the, and the, the estimates from the collecting taxes data set have a much have a much wider spread between um, zero up to up to one. Um, so again, on average, versus vis a vis this other data set that has done um, tax effort score estimation, uh, the approach we take ends up with a more conservative estimate of tax effort scores in almost every case. Okay, so let me move to talking about the limitations and some concluding remarks of work uh, like this. Um, essentially, our main, I think, takeaway is that recent estimates of tax, tax effort have, in many cases, we think, been substantial underestimates. Um, primarily, primarily, this is due to the methodology employed. Um, we highlighted that the different modeling uh, assumptions can give you vastly different tax effort scores, um, um, and you end up with, with a, a massive variation in scores across countries. Um, and ultimately, where these sorts of scores have entered policy dialogues, um, this can be potentially misleading. To tell a policymaker that his or her country is collecting 30% of its potential um, when in actual fact, it's probably collecting 80, 85% of its potential um, are two very different messages. Um, so we hope that the work that we've done here is in some way convincing um, and can lead to a more conservative sort of use of these scores, um, but a more responsible use uh, as well. We also find that the, the other methods um, that had previously been employed are very sensitive to outliers in the inputs to the model. And if you read the paper, we give a few sort of examples of those um, where we think that that's something at play. In terms of a few more limitations, um, we've covered tax efforts in this presentation. Um, for a lot of countries, a more salient measure to focus on is actually revenue effort. Um, there are a number of resource-rich countries which barely collect any tax whatsoever, but do collect a lot of government revenue via royalties or other non-taxes. Um, so if you look at um, some countries um, that are very, very rich according to, um, because of natural resources, they might have a very low tax effort according to our estimations. But of course, they're collecting a lot of revenue um, elsewhere from non-tax instruments. Uh, so that is one limitation to looking at tax effort scores. Uh, we we, we will be publishing, I think, uh, both revenue and tax effort scores at some point according to this methodology. A major limitation as well is that tax effort scores are backward looking. Um, they don't predict how much tax revenue country X could collect tomorrow or next year in the next five years. The scores are based on a set of inputs um, at in the past for which we have data. So, you know, given the size of a certain economy, how open it is to international trade, the structure of its economy, how urbanized it is, um, how well do we think it's doing or how well does the model think it's doing compared to its potential. Um, another key limitation is that tax effort scores likely means something quite different in developing countries to high income countries. Um, I think it's probably reasonably fair to say that most low income countries would like to collect some more tax revenue or would like to collect as much tax revenue as possible. But at some point along the development path, the, the choice of how much tax to collect becomes more of a political decision, which is reflective of society's preferences over some appropriate level of government spending. Um, so think about um, whether whether the, the particular party in power is more fiscally conservative or fiscally liberal. Um, that may lead to differences in the, in the um, amount of tax collected. So there is a point at which tax effort scores do mean something different for different groups of countries. Um, and that's an important thing to bear in mind. We definitely don't suggest that anyone should be relying on tax effort scores to guide strategy or donor strategy or make judgments of tax collection in developing countries or recommendations. They are very high level indicators. Um, we think they're a useful part of a toolkit for assessing tax performance or tax potential in a country. Definitely shouldn't be solely um, relied upon. Um, there are many other indicators that can be useful guides as to where tax tax uh, 
collection performance may be enhanced going forward. For example, a lot of countries are now under, undertaking tax expenditure reporting. A lot of countries have undertaken VAT gap analysis, for example. So there are, there are a lot of different modeling techniques in, in the toolkit that can be employed um, concurrently to get a picture of, of a tax collection in a given country. Um, so I, I hope we can sort of stress that point. But, but definitely in a world where tax effort scores are being used, and we hope that the, 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 the modest methodological improvements we've made leads to a more realistic expectation on the side of tax effort. Ultimately, though, the bottom point is probably the most important one. Um, a very narrow focus on revenue targeting, whether it's informed by tax to GDP ratio targets or tax effort scores, distracts from wider efforts to develop more equitable, broad-based and fair taxation. Um, arguably, these are more important targets and goals in the long run in the uh, domestic resource mobilization arena. So I'd, I'd probably leave it with that thought. And just to sort of wrap up finally, um, the scores that we've estimated in this paper, um, we have committed to updating them annually and publishing them alongside the government revenue data set on the wider website. And the first set of those estimates will be published online within a couple of weeks um, alongside uh, the working paper here. Um, so I will leave it there and pass back to Abrams. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kyle. Um, it's been a very good presentation. And so far we've learned a lot. So we'll would move to the panel discussion. We'd we'll start with Joyce. Joyce, please share your reflections, after which would we'll move to Michael. So Joyce, please. I think while waiting for Joyce to you know, sort out her computer or something, Michael, I think you can begin. Yeah, yeah, I think I can take that up while Joyce tries to sort this up. So many thanks, Abrams, and many uh, thanks. Cal for the uh, you know for the presentation as well. I'll just add some few bits to what uh, Cal has you know said. I have three three minor points here, which I will just elaborate. I think the first thing is that we have a very wide data coverage using the 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 grd and the and the other data sources uh, this is very you know important and we would have to stress that so in all we have a full sample of about 161 countries and then a data spanning from 1980 all the way up to 2019, which we would also update as well. So I think these things are, are quite significant and uh, we, we, we would have to take note of that. Then the other thing that Carl talked about, I think Carl talked about the uh, global average for the tax effort. Uh, it, for the tax effort scores, all right, which is about 0 0.84. Uh, but I think the main point is that the, the you know, the uh, global tax average masks a lot of the de details. Uh, what we have, we, you know, also have a times series of the tax effort uh, scores for all these over 161 countries from 1980 all the way to 2019 as well. And then, yes, there are some countries, particularly in the Sub-Saharan Africa that have low tax scores as well, you know, below, uh, Seventy percent in in these cases. So, so, so we we have a time series which is very uh, detailed 
that uh, others can really, you know, engage with. with. One thing that also struck me when we did this work is that there is a lot of a variation in tax effort scores within countries. So if you look, look at the times series for particular countries, they're not just stagnant, no. You see a lot of variation in there and I think that is a key as, as well. It would be great to understand what really, what really explains that within countries. Is it some type of legislation? Is it some donor effect playing out? What, what is really going on there? And, and I think that once we, we put these things out there, you know, re, re, researchers can get into the detail and then look at what is, what, what is really explaining this, you know, variation within these uh, countries. Let me end by talking about the policy to Kate. I mean, I, I think that the tax effort scores are very, very important, you know, as part of the tax policy to get four countries, especially looking at individual countries here. And here, I think it's very important to look at the gap between the potential and that of the actual tax, what we call the tax, what you call it the effort. Actually, it's, it's the inverse of that, that would give you the, the you know, the tax effort. If the gap is high, all right, in this case, if, the, if you have a low tax effort, then yes, there is a need to, to actually push tax authorities to see how best they could collect more taxes. But that is when your gap is high and the tax effort is low. But what if the, the, the gap is low and your tax effort is high? Do you still push tax authorities to, 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 to you know, go on and to, and to, and to, and to collect taxes? No. What one may do in this case is to actually find ways to, to actually push the, the tax frontier up. In this case, it's about looking at how to expand or how to increase the tax port, port, uh, the tax potential of that uh, particular uh, country. So, so I think these are things that we would ha have to take note of. And so trying to get as much as possible some, some good estimates of the tax effort scores is, 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 is you know, very good here. So what really happens is that if there is that low gap and that high tax effort scores, then they need to, to be a complete shift here from the normal rate rhetoric of aggressive taxation and aggressive taxation. But clearly, if this is high, then how do we push up the tax frontier? So that, that, that is, the what you call it, the thinking that must go into this when trying to look look at the tax effort scores uh, uh, for you know uh, countries. And let me end here, and I think we can uh, come back and talk about many things. Well, thanks, Michael. Um, Joyce, you can come on now. Okay. Um, thank you for for the presentation. My apologies, I came in a bit late, but I was able to capture quite a few things and also from the data that I reviewed. I think for me, um, the major things that we highlighted by Kyle, one of the most important things for me is that at the end of the day, when we do research, the purpose is for us to have 
uh, recommendations or to cite the implications of whatever we would have done in terms of research. So in terms of the work that was done here, um, there are quite a number of things that are quite pleasing in my perspective from a researcher's perspective. Uh, largely because at the end of the day, we find people making decisions in terms of policy making guided by what we would have found in terms of in terms of research. So I think the idea of using a stochastic frontier analysis uh, model is uh, can be should be applauded because it gives us a better picture, especially on the aspect of disentangling the random effects as well as the inefficiencies. I can cite an example and say, the moment you're able to understand whether your inefficiencies are for the short term or they are coming from the long term, you are able to tell what kind of policies you should be using. So I think moving away from uh, the normal methods that were used or the usual methods that were used and using this kind of model, the SFA, you find that a better picture and move closer to reality because at times for sure we've seen scenarios where random effects have been counted as inefficiencies and that is not the issue at hand. Then the other issue that I would also want to highlight is um, one of the major important aspects coming from the research in terms of implications. There's the issue that if we are referring to text effort studies that have been done now as being backward looking, then it also means for researchers, there's needs for the research community to think about forward looking methods that will allow us to have a better picture of what the future has as opposed to what we have seen from, from the past in terms of looking at the historical report. But nonetheless, it doesn't take away the beauty that comes with being able to make those estimations, especially using the methods that have been cited here. One of the most important aspects also for me was that there are scenarios where even on, for instance, if I look at the African context, there are countries where if you look at their tax efforts, they're actually high and there's um, a low gap but when you look at policy making, you find that the recommendations that are almost put out each and every other time are the same uh, recommendations as if you have low effort and you have got a high gap. So I think from the research, there's a lot that uh, researchers can take back in terms of um, if you're going to look at individual countries, because at some point you can have revenue authorities within specific countries looking for solutions. So the research comes with a lot of insight that when we come at country level, implement those uh, methods and to try to see whether we can improve on whatever has been made and to ascertain for sure whatever recommendations have been made in the past for specific countries, do they go hand in hand with uh, what comes out from using uh, the SFA for specific countries. So for my analysis, I was just trying to check for country levels, how many countries have really tried to use the stochastic frontier, especially in developing countries at individual level you find that it's quite rare because whilst we talk of 10 to 15 years, you find that most people have not got to the level of actually understanding what you mean by disentangling the random effects as well as the inefficiencies. So the paper comes with a lot of um, wealth in terms of what you can take back as uh, researchers. And also when you try to dismystify what you mean by what you mean they are random effects, they are inefficiencies. For the donor community, I think it becomes also very clear because normally you do have questions where people are not quite understanding what you mean by, by random effects because the technical or others. But when you talk about this inefficiency, even to revenue authorities, when you talk about looking at the short run, looking at the long run, it becomes very clear to say maybe you should do certain activities in the short run to avoid this problem, then in the long run you can do this. So that's the beauty of using the stochastic front analysis. Then also, um, I wanted to highlight that um, also one of the important aspects from the paper was that besides just looking at text effort, the, the idea of also embracing the use of a revenue effort is something that we need to take back. No matter look at the revenue, our countries that, have got, that are resource rich, I'll give examples of the areas close to me. Angola is an example. You can talk of Mozambique, even Zimbabwe included you find that there's not much effort that has been put towards grasping what can be done with countries that have got low tax effort, but they do have a lot of uh, resources, but those are not accounted for. So I think also for the donor community, it's also good that when people broaden their minds to go and look at uh, issues like revenue effort, you get a better picture because when people are said, for instance, we are unable to fight poverty because we have low taxes, but when a country is resource rich, then you find that there's a problem. So the beauty of what Kyle was saying was that 
we are able to broaden our minds to say, we don't stop at taxes alone. There are other forms of revenue that we can also look at. So in formal sector perspective, I think there's a lot that we, including myself, can take away from this research and put forward in terms of maybe expanding what has been done. We also maybe looking closer at different context size for each and every country, trying to use the same methods, but trying to find out if I'm doing for Zimbabwe or any other country, what is likely to happen? What insights are we going to get? So I, I believe that um, it gives us a new way of thinking. And I think it is important because as we have revisited the question, we might come up with different answers. What we have predicted maybe in the past may not be true because the estimates we are using were not actually giving us the right feet on the ground. So I think for, for me, these are some of the important issues that I found from the study. Uh, otherwise, thank you. All right, thank you very much for your remarks, Joyce. They're very accurate. And for those who have read the paper, you know, you find that she's able to pinpoint some inconsistencies across um, previous findings, which is what motivated our use of the paper, or motivated us to write the paper to begin with. So now the floor is open to a Q&A session. I was going to ask the first question, but that's not uh, no longer the case. We have a question in the chat from Olu Akinkugwe. So it goes thus, any sort of consideration for regional differences or spatial heterogeneity? For example, the tax effort in Southern Africa differs substantially from what obtains in West Africa and other African regions. Just same as tax capacity is just not even. Hence, lumping SSA countries together as a unit seriously impacts the results. So I think the question is about, you know, um, breaking countries down in terms of geographical region and also possibly in terms of their level of development. So what can we say about that, Kyle? Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, we, um, in the modeling, we haven't done a lot to account for spatial heterogeneity along those lines, but I do agree with what you're saying. Like, obviously, tax effort and tax institutions in, in different parts of, for example, the continent of Africa do differ strongly. Um, we do, I maybe I should just apologize for the way in which the results were presented because I did show the regional averages. Um, the paper does break down the tax effort scores at a country by country level. So um, you can check where Botswana is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Uganda, vis-a-vis -vis Ghana. Um, so we do do that. Um, and I, I'm not sure that in the modeling we sort of put in any sort of geographic uh, control variables in there, but it might be something that might be useful to, to look at. Thanks. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, now a question from myself. Um, we know that there is a difference between revenue effort and tax effort, uh, the former being influenced by the availability of natural resources and also receipts of foreign aid. What kind of policy implications might there be in circumstances where the revenue effort differs fundamentally from the tax effort, you know? I mean, for example, in Nigeria, where they have a lot of natural resources, it's not entirely um, unusual to assume that revenue effort and tax effort are going to differ fundamentally. Likewise, in other countries that receive a lot of foreign aid, for example, Afghanistan or Tanzania, it's fair to assume that revenue effort and tax effort are going to differ fundamentally. So are there any important you know, policy implications for that? Um, thanks. In terms of important policy implications, I'm not entirely sure. Um, obviously you see these discrepancies for the reasons that you've discussed, perhaps natural resource wealth or a large dependence on, on foreign aid. Um, I suppose ultimately it depends on on expectations. Let let let's say let's say the 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 revenue effort is quite good, but the tax effort might be estimated to be quite poor in a country because of large natural resource wealth. Um, it it may be the case that um, one might want to think about how sustainable is is it to rely on revenues from that resource. Is it likely to be a resource that can fund development in the country for many years to come? Um, or should should that country be looking to move away to alter its revenue mix more toward domestic taxation or taxation of 
of employment or or domestic activity um which ultimately in the long run has implications for designing a fair and equitable tax system and for tax morale as well which in the long run can help to boost collections so I don't think there's one one size fits all answer to your question but that's just some thoughts on the case of resource rich countries which means in trying to develop a toolkit for each country would it be logical to um, you know assume that countries with those significant resource, uh, resources or foreign aid is it more interesting to look at their revenue effort or their tax effort in your opinion um I will sit firmly in the fence and say it depends um, because some countries that might be resource rich might rely on certain tax instruments to collect revenue from that resource, whilst other countries might rely on royalties or non-tax payments to collect revenue from that resource. So it's entirely down to the fiscal system in place in each country. And through the work we've done in the GRD, we've seen massive discrete disparities between countries that are perhaps in, under some definitions equally rich in natural resources, but some might collect a lot of non-tax revenues and some might collect a lot of tax revenues from that resource. Um, so it ultimately comes down to the way in which a uh, fiscal policy is applied country to country. Okay, thank you. Which now brings me to my second question. I mean, um, based on the analysis of you know, tax effort indices, under which circumstances can the you know tax frontier or tax potential be pushed forward? Because in uh, as as Michael described, you may have a situation where you have a low tax gap, and then there are high tax effort scores, which means that tax reform to improve tax effort is not you know particularly useful. Which now brings us to a situation where the entire tax frontier has to be pushed. And I'm thinking this is more like a remark anyway. It's going to be based on the you know structure of the economy right informality may be high trade may be low urbanization may be low which is what is making the you know uh, tax frontier to be low but for the frontier to be pushed is going to depend almost exclusively on the political settlement in, in, I mean, in each country what kinds of incentives you know i mean if you were a policymaker in a country what do you think are the kinds of incentives which can be brought forward for the policymakers to push the tax frontier forward? Um, let me first try to answer that. And I might pass to Michael afterward if if he has more to add. Um, but you I mean you sort of you sort of pick up on something that um both both Michael and Joyce raised that in many many relatively low income countries, we see a tax effort score that's actually relatively good or quite close to one, right? Um, and that's saying that given the inputs in the model, country X is actually doing okay or is exerting a reasonably good tax effort. Um, and I think that's an important message to come out of our work. And I think that's a very intuitive method as well. If you look at the inputs that go into the model for somewhere like, say, Uganda, where I live, GDP per capita is quite low, informality is quite high, we have a large share of agriculture and GDP, we're not particularly urbanized. Um, so given that our tax ratio is in the region of 13 or 14 percent to me given the low value of many of the inputs that's a reasonable score to come out but if we put in inputs to a model that say you know economically this country is doing quite poorly then the tax effort score is 0 0.3 i don't see how those two things square with one another and that's what we were seeing from previous work um my my sense then is how do you then push the frontier forward if you're almost at it that comes through improvements in, as you say, the input variables, such as the level of development, the structure of the economy. Um, how that translates into actionable policy advices may be difficult. Um, it, you can't go to a country and say, please find natural resources. It will help your tax effort in future, or it will push your tax frontier. Uh, you can't do that. But but there may be um, there may be work to be done to trying to unpack the the effect of each of those individual input variables on where the tax effort score is relative to the frontier. Um, say, suggesting, you know, okay, if you rebalance your economy two points away from agriculture toward manufacturing or something, we could maybe make predictions in a forward-looking model, as Joyce was mentioning, about what that might mean for tax effort uh, and tax revenue collection down the line. Um, but I might be speculating there. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add on that one? 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Carl. I think that technically, I mean, what one can do is to, you know, improve the, you know, inputs that go into the determining the the attacks frontier. So I mean, so so these things will need to be looked at in a way that we can, what do you call it, improve that. So that's that's what I can say from the from the technical side. But if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, many of the many of the the countries have natural resources, so oils and then you know fuels as well. I mean, clearly there is that excessive focus on the exploitation of these natural resources, and less focus on the governance aspect of of this, and less focus on adding value to these, you know, uh, what do you call it, re, you know, so, uh, so, 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 so yes, it's, it's, it's a bit indirect, but for them to improve their inputs that goes into pushing their tax frontier, these are some of the things that they, you know, need to be uh, thinking about. All right, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Kyle. We have another question. This is probably taking us to a different kind of literature on the formality of firms. So it's from Ethio Degefe Anulo. So it's a question for Kyle and Joyce. For countries that have very large underground economies, how can they bring those informal, um, you know, informal sector firms into the formal sector to boost revenue mobilization? So um, this might take us into theories of formalization or empirics. So anybody can respond to the question. Kyle, Michael, Joyce, you know. I, I, th I think this this is a big question. I work on, you know, what you call the issues of informality. So this is the biggest question we you know have thus far. How do you transition informal firms, be it those in the upper tier or those in the lower tier to formal, you know, what do you call it there? What do you call it there, employment? I mean, the, the, the big issue is that, yes, you can transition them to formal employment or, you know, in, into the formal sector, but it's it's more of a long term thing, you know. So, so yes, you can do that, but it's this is in the long term. So there is much focus on what can be done in the short to medium term, trying to find ways to boost their levels of productivity and on and on. But the whole effort to formalization has not worked. There's been a lot of effort. And these are, there's actually been what is called a formalization re, you know, versa. So people move into formality and then after a year or two just fall back. And, and so this, these are the bigger questions we you know, need to look into and find ways of you know, addressing them. All right, thanks, Michael. Um... Before we wrap up, Joyce, do you have any comments? All right. Um, in terms of the informal sector, there are direct ways um, or indirect ways, just as Michael has highlighted. We can talk about formalization, but indirect, indirect methods. For instance, um, in Zimbabwe, they introduced uh, a mobile transaction tax, which is about 2%. This has boosted revenue in Zimbabwe by a notable mag mag magnitude. So they, I think for policymakers, it depends on the situation that they are facing. The first reason that we need to understand is that when people are in the informal sector, they are not there by choice mostly. They are factors which could be within the policy environment, which makes it difficult for them to formalize. So the idea of formalization is good, but just like Michael has highlighted, it may take time. So what do we do in the short term? Normally, I believe that indirect methods would be the ones that would work. 
And um, if you look also at the, the world that we're living in now, most of the things have become digitalized, including people are operating in the informal sector. They are also using these platforms. So from a policy perspective, there's need for government to, most governments to review uh, taxation and digitalization. I believe in most developing countries, governments are still struggling to come up with ways of um, taxing uh, the digital economy. So those are some of the ways in which we can try to uh, try to tax the informal sector, or, or maybe they have policies that provide incentives, just like I was saying, the incentives that can be given to um, financial uh, financial technology companies to embrace more and more people in the sector. That way, then government is able to then tax, just like I was giving the example of the mobile tax. So I think for us, the options that are close to being realistic for now are to use indirect methods as opposed to trying to find direct methods of formalizing the formal sector. Because why they are not by choice, normally it's because of the environment that we live in. That's the contribution that I wanted to make. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joyce. Um, we have a question from James McKeon. So Ghana recently introduced an electronic transaction tax in an effort to increase the tax frontiers. The results have been abysmal. Apart from tax collection efficiency, which appears not to be the reason for the poor outcome of the taxation effort, what other factors may account for low taxation under such circumstances? I mean, the, James, what springs to mind is, you know, um, maybe the tax was introduced without the government first being apprised of the local economic context, right? If you introduce an electronic transaction tax, when most of the transactions are carried out in cash, then you really can't expect to receive as much money from the tax as you would normally do if there were electronic transactions. Those are my two cents. So Kyle, Michael, please. Um, I'm not sure how much I have to add to what Abrams has said. Um... So the question saying tax collection efficiency appears not to be the reason for outcome of tax effort. What other factors may account? Um, I mean, I mean, at least from, from our own work, if you're referring to our own modeling, um, it's it's essentially the inputs that go into the model that sort of determine the level of tax effort. Um, and ultimately, we've modeled tax collection as a function of those. Um, but as Abrams has said, sometimes there's a policy that's poorly designed and poorly implemented. Um, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be so entirely sure that tax collection or tax administrative efficiency isn't always at least part of the reason why tax collection can be poor. Um, and that's something that's actually quite difficult to control for in the sort of work um, that we're doing. Indicators of of administrative efficiency across countries aren't aren't always easy to to come by. Uh, hope, hopefully that in, in, at least in part answers uh, the question. Okay, um, it's past our time, so we would have to bring this to a close. So thank everyone for joining. Thank you very much, Kyle, for taking out the time to give this presentation. Personally, I've learned a lot, and I'm guessing the other people in the audience have learned as well. We thank the panelists, Michael, um, Joyce, for participating and engaging and sharing their reflections. We also thank our staff at you and you wider for helping make this possible. So Eva, who has been relentlessly sharing the links in the chat, and Yuta, who you know put this up together. For future purposes, there is a GRD network, so you may want to join the mailing list. It provides the latest news on GRD and it keeps you updated on all things GRD. This is the first, as I said, the first of um, a series of webinars looking at new perspectives into domestic revenue mobilization. So the next one is going to be on the 18th of October, starts at the same time, titled World Energy, looking ahead to COP27. So it's going to be advertised and announced um, a couple of weeks from now. Please register and so you can attend, and I'm sure it's going to be as engaging as this one. So thank you all for joining and you know, see you some other time.